I'm both um, incredibly excited to be here today, but also very appreciative. Um, I see this uh, workshop as, as, as sort of marking uh, the culmination of almost five years of work uh, on, on my part and also initiating a whole new phase. So um, I'm going from my little universe, my cocoon. Um, I created this work out of intense frustration. <laughs> um, and I'm sure it's a frustration that many of you share. Uh, I teach French at Cornell. Uh, I'm in a department of Romance Studies where the divide between language and literature is so entrenched and so uh, um, set. Uh, it's institutionally supported and sustained. And I will never in my lifetime see a coming together of those two, <laughs> two fields. Um, so m one of my frustrations has to do with working in this kind of environment and knowing that I want to do something else. And so I've been incredibly fortunate to um, have had this uh, connection then with Carl, uh, who actually did his PhD at Cornell. Um, and so we met because you had come back uh, in that context. But then also the whole team at Coral, uh, Natalie and I worked a lot together. You'll see uh, some of the visuals. Um, for uh, creating, in fact, these are uh, the visuals created for my textbook. So um, the frustration of the context of where I work, uh, the frustration also of commercial textbooks. And I would add to the notion of OER, you've, we've talked about the, this, the sense of, of accessibility of education, but I also want to talk about within my context, and one of my reasons for creating these materials is that I was intensely frustrated with the quality uh, of, uh, 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 let's say, or the perspective and the assumptions, the understandings of language that is um, um, so uh, typical of foreign language textbooks. And I've, after reading the MLA report of 2007, which really spoke to me, I said, wow, this is what I've been doing for so many years. I was an ESL teacher, actually, originally for many years. And I taught in a number of different contexts. Um, and actually, my undergraduate uh, work at Barnard and Columbia was in Chinese uh, studies. So uh, I, I've done a number of different things as a language learner, uh, language teacher. I taught in China. I taught in, in France. Uh, I've been married to a Frenchman for 31 years. I had never planned to teach French. This was not uh, my agenda at all. Uh, but circumstances, actually 2011, um, forced the closing of the intensive English program where I was teaching at Cornell. My colleagues lost their jobs, and I was able to morph into uh, becoming a teacher of French. But I landed in this alternate universe of this Romance Studies department where all of the values were skewed uh, from my perspective. And uh, I just thought, wow, how can I survive uh, in this context? So, so these frustrations really uh, uh, came together. And um, through the help of Carl and uh, Coral, um, allowed me to create this project. So that is the, the first sort of five years of, the, of this project, the creating of the textbook. And much of the creation of the textbook that time was searching for texts, open texts on the internet, because we didn't yet have the kind of mechanisms that Carl will be showing to you later about finding open texts. So I was surfing, surfing, surfing. And um, it was both enriching in many ways, but um, a bit of a frustration. So that, uh, I think, is uh, something that you will have perhaps less of, <laughs> that frustration of finding open texts. Um, so, so yes. Firing. So we're going to be finishing each other's sentences a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, actually, there's another part of the story that I think is interesting. And, um, and that is that she had adopted, she was the coordinator of French at Cornell. And she had adopted Conscient Antique, which is an open textbook that we produced here at, at UT Austin. And <coughs> we produce now, so this is a coral now. And she was the one who said, you know, I like parts of this, but I don't like other parts of it, which is universal. All teachers say that about materials. And part of it is because it was, it was, it was produced at a particular institution, and so it's localized at that institution, such that your job as a professional to adapt to the materials to your local context. That's exactly what she did. She kind of contacted us sheepishly and said, can I produce my own literary materials? Because it seems like it's a little strong in all kinds of readings, but not the kind of reading that. And I said, of course, it's open. That's the whole point. Go for it. And she ended up not just doing one or two activities, she created an entire, a really brilliant type of a this is the text. supplement. So that's, she actually kind of incarnates what we're talking about here, and that is open educators looking at something and then saying, I need to adapt it to my local context and then pushing it forward. What we did with, with, I think, the important piece of the story from my perspective is that we joined with 
Joanna and started teaching her about the digital practices of open education. So we started telling her about open texts and we started, she would come and say, I found this great text. I said, nope, it's copyrighted. Nope, I'm sorry, Dalima has that, nope, yeah, you can't use that. And so finally we started hammering home the idea that we really wanted her to use open text because if you use an open text, what she creates can then keep on being created by other people. And then we talked to her about uh, Creative Commons licenses and how to license all of these different materials, which we'll be talking about today. So that was our kind of joining forces with Joanna, and we just let her run wild, and we'll see later on today what, um, what she did with that. So we want to thank you and to Joanna. <laughs> well, and actually, so this is what the, the textbook looks like uh, online, and it is truly open, not just in terms of its licensing. It's in Google Docs, which means that these words are down, these documents are, are, are downloadable in Word, and you can do whatever you wish to each chapter. You can modify these texts to the extent that you desire to fit your context, as long as you maintain attribution. That is the one criteria that I you know, insist upon and that open uh, licensing insists upon. There are different, different types of licensing that you can have, but I really wanted this to be the most open uh, that, that could be. So as far as I know, this is the only textbook out there that allows that degree of freedom. So, and I also want to say uh, the notion of attribution is the sine qua non. You cannot produce any of the materials today without talking about attribution. So we're talking about how to create an infrastructure for sharing. That does not mean plagiarism. That does not mm -hmm. mean piracy. That means creating a legal system where people respect each other's intellectual property. And that is hugely important, yeah. which is why I want people to use these licenses so that you signal the rules of the game to other people who stumble across your materials. And we'll talk more about that. But that's really one of the issues that we're trying to get people to understand is it protects you, but it also protects other end users. So it helps make it helps clarify the rules of the game. Okay. So yeah, so I sort of brought you up to the present and now uh, Chantelle, I think the goal was for you to think about, since she's the program director um, at, uh, at uh, University of Arizona, where you're seeing Where where do I come in? Where do yes. you come in? Yeah. During our last, we all had to reapply for the language resource centers, these 16 language resource centers. Mm -hmm. And at that point, everyone starts to get very creative because you think, <laughs> what projects do we want to do in this next grant, yes, grant cycle? Um, and a persistent interest of mine has been um, creative and aesthetic and effective aspects of language and how those uh, play a role or could play a role in the development of second or foreign language literacy. Um, in addition to that, we had um, not quite the same frustrations that Joanna was uh, naming. We have a, a pretty good textbook for one of the courses, um, our intermediate level course that we um, teach at our university, um, but it relies heavily on literary texts. And something that we kept experiencing with students is that they would say, well, this is all well and good, but what does literature have to do with language? Mm -hmm. And we were wanting, trying to get better at communicating to the students that it does, in fact, have a lot to do with language, um, that the literary is part of language, and literature, of course, is language as well. Um, but one of our ways of uh, trying to uh, negotiate that and address that was to bring in a mixture of what we could call digital vernacular texts. And so we've been developing a unit on gaming and also trying to expand that into things like Facebook and social media texts, um, as well as MEMS. You'll see a little bit of that today. Um, and I've been working with uh, two of the instructors in our program, Diane Richardson and Christine Lange, who are here today, um, who've done a lot on developing that aspect of the curriculum um, and trying to tie together the literariness of that language. Uh, we weren't quite talking about it that way, but a lot of what we were doing is kind of focus on form and that materiality of the language through these digital vernacular texts. Um, and then Circle, this is a position that I stepped into um, about a year ago. Uh, we're the Center for Educational Resources for Culture, Language, and Literacy. So in addition to the shared mission of the language resource centers that Carl already mentioned to build this capacity for foreign language education in the US, our particular focus is on those um, the ways in which language and culture are or should be integrated in language education and the development of literacy. Um, and we think of literacy in the kind of multi-literacy sense of involving um, multimodality, of involving also digital literacies, of involving cultural literacy, and looking for the ways in which those intersect. And so when I started talking with uh, Joanna and Carl about this project, the literary and the everyday felt to me like a really good concept to think with, to bring all of these different aspects together in some sense in a way that felt um, big enough but also coherent enough 
um, to really get at this, these um, really creative aspects of language that happen in everyday texts um, and to use that as a way to foster awareness in language learners of the various ways in which language does a whole lot more than just communicate instrumental or propositional meanings, that it does a whole lot of other stuff that we often don't get a chance to address in the beginning and intermediate level classrooms. This so, is ad adapting kind of a multi-literacies framework. It also resonates with other areas such as digital humanities because we're talking about all kinds of new genres that are coming out, so new digital forms. And importantly, it, it is a joint project between our two, so it's a collaborative project between our two institutions, our two uh, National Foreign Language Resource Centers, and we're making a commitment, a four-year project commitment. So this workshop is really kind of our launch today. And as I said, what we want to do is create a community of practice and bring it back to programs around the country so that you start to know how to do all these different things that Joanna now knows. We're hoping that all of you, many of you will also become participants because one of the things about open educational resources is that they're not just open to use, they are importantly that, but they're also open in that um, people work together collaboratively to develop them, to further them, to create new manifestations of them. So we're hoping that many of you will be not just hearing about the project, but be part of the project as it goes forward. And we'll be talking a little bit about those opportunities throughout the workshop. One of the things that teachers need to understand is that copyright is actually a bundle of rights, so it's a plural concept. And if you ever see the C in the circle is the trademark for copyright, and you've all seen the C in that circle, it's usually followed in English text by three words, all rights reserved, which means that, you know, it's like this, I'm taking all of my toys and you're not playing along with me. But importantly, it's a plural concept, and we're gonna break that down into its constituent parts. Attribution is only one part of copyright. Copyright is hundreds of years old, so it preceded the, the internet by a long time. And it doesn't make a lot of sense for uh, the digital age. It's, it's a little wobbly, and that, that's what we're trying to do now, is update our notions of copyright to be able to, instead of saying all rights reserved, I'm gonna reserve everything for me, it's some rights reserved. You all get to negotiate the relationship between your text, your authorship, and how you want to give that away to other people, okay? Including whether you want other people to make profit on your materials, because some people are terrified by this concept of what I created, I wrote an article, I'm gonna give it away, and then you're going to cannibalize that. This has to be a legal system. Uh, creative Commons is the brainchild behind this. We'll be showing you the Creative Commons website. Creative Commons licenses have now held up in courts of law uh, all over the world because it's not, remember that little video I showed you, open education is not just something that's happening in the United mm -hmm. States. The video was actually made by an African team, it's a South African team. Mm -hmm. And again, coming back to the notion of um, a social system that gets closed down, we're really focusing on opening up education and so it's more important uh, in, in countries in Africa, for example, where they don't have access, and many people don't have access to materials at all because they're out of the reach of teachers. Many of you work in institutional contexts where getting credit for things you produce is really important for various reasons, either to demonstrate professional development, to get promotion, to get tenure, things like that. And so one of the things that we want to talk about at the end of the project and think about with you is also ways in which um, open educational resources and hopefully projects like this can help us also to make visible the kinds of work that people do in creating educational materials that often get a little bit obscured in some of those institutional contexts. They don't count in the same way that, for example, research publications do. Um, so how do we integrate things like peer review system um, and uh, credit giving into a project like this is one of the things that's on our minds. Right. So for the next, say, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, if in your groups, if you can exchange, uh, uh, present the, the text or text that you brought in, why, what you think uh, um, is the, uh, are the dimensions of the literary in the everyday for you, what your notion at this point in time is of the literary in the everyday. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have maybe about 10 minutes so that we can kind of just get a sense of what different groups uh, um, have discussed and, and what some of the key concepts are that are coming out of your work. And I and, want to say also, mm. not everybody does their homework assignment. So if you, <laughs> if you, if you are here and you didn't have uh, to yes. bring your text with you, oh, 
um, then you still you can still talk about what yes. is the concept, what does that mean, what, as she said, what does it evoke for you, the literary and everyday, and you might imagine then some possible text that would exemplify that category. Make sure that you have a sufficient number of texts to talk about, I think, um, and then these okay. concepts yeah. of rather than us telling you what the literary and the everyday is, how do these texts represent that, um, and then also looking for differences in what you brought in, but also in the perceptions that you have around those texts. So an explanation of sorts of what the literary in the everyday means to you. Or both. So um, the text that I chose had to do with immigration. And we were talking about different aspects of immigration. And I don't think that we've ever lived in, well, as far as we know, that we've ever lived in a time where immigration has been a topic which has been discussed more throughout Mm -hmm. every media, through conversations at the dinner table, through uh, arguments with friends and that sort of thing. And uh, we felt as though immigration very much is, uh, a text about immigration mm -hmm. is very much a representation of the literature in day-to-day -day life because we're seeing it played out in the news, we're seeing it played out in, um, in a variety of different places. But the thing that we found very interesting in our conversation is that immigration always seems to be covered or discussed in terms of the other from the third world mm. coming to Europe or the United States. And we realized in our discussion that immigration is not always that type of phenomenon. And we want to consider looking for texts which talk about different types of immigration mm. around the world to better represent literature and daily life. I will say, notice that you say literature in the everyday, and the phrase is the literary right. in the everyday. We're having problems with that. Yes, We're so, exactly, exactly. Yes. So, other, yeah. Ideas about the literary in the everyday. So, all of our works begin with A. So ah. Mm -hmm. So, our characteristics that we felt was the literary and everyday are authentic. Mm. We wanted some kind of representation of the cultures or the languages we speak or spoken, which were French, Spanish, Chinese, and German. Mm. Effective, with an A, mm -hmm. so it has to touch some kind of uh, you know effective chord, emotional chord, or something in our students and teachers. Aesthetic, so mm. uh, we should pay attention to the quality of language. Even in um, Adam, sorry, he showed us a uh, something where one of you in the group said it's engaging when you get it which I thought was a really interesting observation as well that was the Adam so I'm still with the a okay <laughs> <laughs> right that there's an effect with an e this time but there's an effect that that happens when you interact with the text which I think mm -hmm. is interesting so, yeah I was on live this summer and um, both the, the ads that I saw at every shop shop it made me pause and made me think about it Yes. draws you into thinking about it. And I think that's where I see a connection between those examples and then also the immigration text, um, with something that's an everyday discourse in the literary, but it defamiliarizes that everyday discourse, in a sense. I teach a course every other year called Adultery in French literature, and we read very classical texts like Princess Madame Bovary, 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 the, the word every day is the most important word for me in this workshop. Adultery is everywhere on the news related to fidelity and lying and all these things. And so 
asking students to identify the ways, the metaphors that are used, the words that are used to describe those phenomena in everyday life. How, because the military, of course, is, is ever present everywhere. And then sensitize them to maybe metaphors that are used to, to advertise Gone Girl, and then transfer that sense of the literary in the everyday, in advertisements, in, in scenes, in movies, in advertisements, to the kinds of things that we encounter in a literary text. So that's kind of a traditional way of thinking about it. And then my partner here talked about that being possible using song as well. Uh, music, obviously, um, all of the discourse, uh, the ways that language is used in song. So we're sort of going out with the theme idea. I don't know if we're right. off beat, off track there, but adult music is good theme. <laughs> <laughs> Very productive, as it were. Very productive. Theme. Not be reproductive in any case. <laughs> <laughs> we were discussing the poetry, which is considered, you know, a very high form of literature. It's not always accessible to students, so they don't necessarily like it because it requires a higher level thinking. You know, sometimes you get into poetry through music and through songs because the words to songs can be very literary. They can be not literary at all. They can be very quotidian, pedestrian even. Um, but it's still art and it's as I was moving around in the groups, and it's been echoed a little bit in what you've been saying, people, I've heard uh, uncertainty expressed in various forms, but I'm not sure if that's what the assignment was, or if I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, or I'm not sure if that's how you're conceptualizing it. And I, I wanted to say that the uncertainty, I think, is part of the project in some senses. Um, in some ways, the term, everyone has a response, I think. I mean, when I was going around, nobody seemed stumped, as in, I have no idea what the literary and the everyday could possibly mean. This is such a strange concept. Everyone had responses to it, but they were quite different responses. So both the diversity of ways in which we can interpret that, as well as the, the ways in which people react to it, I think are why it's, for me, a useful tool to work with. But in our conversations in the summer, th this is not meant to be the corrective definition, but I want to show it because it picks up on what a lot of people have said. We, in our discussions um, among ourselves, started to come up with, well, what, how do we understand this? And we also were coming from different perspectives that overlapped in many ways. And we came up with, as a starting point, three ways of thinking about the literary and the everyday, which I've heard in various forms in what you've been saying. Um, and so one is the literary and everyday genres, so the receipt. Uh, I heard recipes over here in a group, um, the advertisements. Um, we could talk about whether pop music fits in this category or in the next one. Um, and so this is where this literariness, puns and metaphors and different kinds of language play, using words in unusual ways was something I heard brought up, um, features into every day, what we would consider everyday kinds of genres. Then there's also the ways in which there's literary production about the everyday, which I think is part of what you were talking about, right? That Every uh, text that we would consider literary, poems or short stories or novels, will bring in everyday language, um, the vernacular. I think Claudia was talking about medieval texts that feature vernacular language in various ways. So the ways in which everyday discourses or everyday um, language, ways of speaking, come into these, what we would consider conveniently to be literary genres. And then the third category, which I think I mostly take responsibility for, but was my attempt to try to get at something else that I see going on sometimes, which has to do with the ways in which lit what we conveniently consider literary texts kind of cross over into everyday practices and spaces. Um, so we talked about linguistic landscapes here, but the, one of the first examples I had in my head was if, if you're sitting in a bathroom that has graffiti and there's a quote from Shakespeare on the wall, what does that then become in that moment exactly because it's in this really kind of gritty everyday context, but it's a high literary example. Um, or things like literary tourism, um, where people, I was just in London, and it, for those of you who know Harry Potter, right, they have the cart that's sticking out of the wall. So all of a sudden it feels like you're in the Harry Potter novel. What do those moments have to do with um, the literary and the everyday? And there are probably other categories that we haven't even conceived of, uh, but I heard a lot of these echoed in the groups. Some of you had responded to the uh, request of bringing in uh, a text. Well, it's just reading over those responses, and I'm sure that that was what incorporated in some of your discussions today, was that to, to sort of echo what, what um, Chantal was just saying, this concise phrase, the literary in the everyday, evoke so many associations and so many interpretations. And that is actually the essence of what this project is about. So what I wanted to do is to give you the uh, teacher's guide that I created
for my textbook, The Literary and the Everyday, which gives you a much fuller uh, sense of uh, what my thinking was in, in constructing this concept of The Literary and the Everyday. So I want to just go over some of the key terms with you now. This is not to say that this is what it must be and how it needs to be interpreted. It is a starting point. And what is so exciting, which is why I keep saying, I see this as the culmination of five years of, of, of in a sense, work on my part. And now it's about opening it up to other people to interpret. But there are, I would say there is at least one dimension to thinking about the literary in the everyday. And that has to do with the notion, which was, of course, a big part of the um, MLA report of 2007. But the question then became, well, what does that mean? Um, has to do with an approach that comes from, whether it's from cognitive linguistics or uh, sociocultural theory or uh, systemic functional linguistics. It has to do with understanding language as a semiotic system of systems for meaning making. Now, that's a mouthful, and a lot of people feel alienated uh, when you try to talk about that. Every grammar reference book and all of our textbooks in foreign languages really approach or have that assumption of language as um, um, a computational system of rules and exceptions to rules. So being able to think about language from that very different perspective of it as prototypes, a language evolves a set of prototypes which are then available and prototypes can be words, they can be phrases, sentences, extended passages, whole discourses, genres. It's all of those pieces that then become available to manipulation to create new forms of meaning. And this is something that is the hallmark of difference between the lower levels of uh, foreign language uh, learning and education and upper levels. People assume that you cannot engage in this way in the metaphorical, in the literary, in the, in the uh, uh, poetic at the beginning levels, even though the MLA report said they created this wonderful uh, uh, arc of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, curricular arc of literature and uh, culture from the beginning, language to the end. But how do you practice literature and culture really in, in the ways that at least I felt to be uh, most meaningful to beginning language learners? So the literary, again, from my perspective, refers to the plasticity of language, the resonances, the multiple layers of meaning right, that either single words or complex structures or whole discourses can uh, um, convey. Uh, so it is the metaphorical, the poetic. It's the resonances of meaning that tie language to the mental imagery of the speaker. And that's another dimension that rarely, I mean, words, uh, uh, language in the abstract is not meaning bearing. Not only do you have to put it into context, you also have to kind of get into the mental landscape of the writer or the speaker. And we often just ignore that dimension because we don't really have a sense of how to uh, uh, approach it. So the conceivers construal, the imagery right, um, that is shaped by personal experience and all of these different levels of uh, layers of contextual uh, um, groupings that the uh, um, cultural context that the, that the individual experiences. So um, the literary then is also emblematic of language as culture. So it's really, I, I called my approach to this textbook transdisciplinary. I'm really trying to plug into the commonality between language, literary, and cultural studies and say, we can do this from the beginning if we think about language differently, if we approach language differently. So then the everyday has to do with the basic sort of language and textual prototypes that are so typical of those first uh, years of language uh, teaching. Um, and it, it's, it's everyday for communication, uh, whether it is a literary text or uh, a non-literary text. right? Um, and this is something that, again, the, the assumption has been for so long that you cannot engage students at the lower levels in this kind of work. So um, this is at odds, though, of course, with that curricular arc that the MLA report talked about. And that's something that we're um, trying to address. And hopefully, you'll uh, agree, once you see examples a little bit later, that uh, this can be done and can be, can be done right from the start. So um, the concept here is also that when properly implemented, this approach allows not only for playful manipulation of the linguistic system, it actually can improve grammatical awareness. If you don't expose students, if you only expose students to a very narrow uh, concept of what language is, um, then 
their notion of the grammatical system cannot, they're, they're not exercising it in a way that's allowing them to see that plasticity. And um, it's cognitively inefficient to have uh, so many exceptions to rules. It's just not the way that language uh, functions, right? And how our brains sort of work with language. So it also then promotes symbolic competence as well as communicative. So um, that was the, the, the sort of the framing concept. Again, it's very open. And for you then to see as you start working in this vein, for you to see how the kinds of uh, uh, assumptions that you came in with, the sort of uh, understandings, interpretations that you have, how this might fit within this very open framework. And maybe there might be things that you'll have to question about, about uh, and open yourself up to, uh, if you're willing, to thinking about language in a different way. And very importantly, too, we've been talking about open texts. And this is something that, yeah. In your groups, we heard, I heard uh, a lot of discussion. We heard discussion of people saying, yes, but we're constrained. We have to use a textbook. You can choose. You can create an open lesson for a copyrighted text. So you can actually use the texts that are in your textbook and take a very different approach to them. So you don't have to change your curriculum in that sense, right? The other thing is that you may choose to work with the textbook as it is, but maybe create or substitute one open text instead of the textbook uh, uh, text. So there's a lot of room for working in this vein from the very small incremental uh, um, way to if eventually, if we have enough people who uh, um, participate and we can archive enough uh, uh, materials, that you can actually then create a supplemental reader reading, writing supplement to uh, a textbook. Use the oral oral component from a textbook and supplement with reading and writing. So as already alluded to, what we're going to do is transition a little bit away from more conceptual, more notional discussions of the project, um, which has kind of given you a flavor for where our thoughts are and where this is heading, um, and to talk a little bit more concretely about what we've been making and what we hope to share with you and what we hope for you to participate in. Um, and so the first aspect of that is I'm going to show you a little bit of the website. And that's going to, if you have a laptop or a device, you can go ahead and pull it up. The URL is flight with two L's, F L L I T E dot org. So that's foreign languages and the literary in the everyday. And it also makes for delightful puns. So it's literary and everyday in itself as well. What I'm going to talk to you about is the materials component of the site. Um, and these are really the key things that we have or are starting to have to share and that we're hoping many of you will also maybe develop down the road. Um, and then we're going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, one from my project. These are fairly new. You'll be the first people to see them, really, other than a couple of my uh, graduate students who have kindly given me feedback on them. Um, and then Joanna is going to show you some of the examples um, from the textbook for French that she's created. And I know that many of you teach French and German, but many of you don't. So our purpose is really going to be to show these as examples of what, what these kinds of materials can look like. Um, so we'll walk you through them and walk you through the logic of it. So if you're teaching other languages or work in other languages that are not as of yet represented in the site, um, we still want to use this to invite you in to participate. Um, so the first thing is the materials page. If you are following along and you're at that website, if you click on the top nav bar on materials, you'll end up where I am, I hope. So we, we have in mind, you'll see that some of these are populated and some of them are um, really works in progress. Four kinds of categories under materials that I want to talk to you about. And that gives you a good idea of the different levels of the project as well. Um, the first is perhaps the most obvious, and that's texts. And we'll be talking, um, Carl in particular will be leading you through how to find open texts, um, how to do attribution for them, how to do Creative Commons licensing, and what those might look like. And so what we'll have here, what we have already, is the start of a repository of open texts. Um, various levels of open, so some of them you have to um, not modify, some of them you can modify. We'll talk about that later. Um, but text that can be used as resources. So I wanted to make one comment here. I, I heard a couple of you discussing and you were saying, oh, you thought I meant textbooks. It can be both. When I say a text, it could be um, just a short text, a literary text, or a textbook. We're really going to be focusing, though, on uh, the notion of what is a text mm -hmm. and some and uh, creating lessons around a passage or a short literary text. So that's we work. We didn't have in mind the notion of a textbook per se, but if you're super ambitious, you're going to create lots of uh, lessons, and maybe you can make your own textbook. But 
Otherwise, we're just taking some kind of small today, creating a lesson around a chosen text. But absolutely, a text can be multimodal, so I noticed you were playing songs right away and music, and so you can have them listen, so we can add listening and speaking, and so yes. And even visualizing, as we've been thinking about pedagogical practices and how to describe them, the multimodal coming in as well. So we'll, we'll be talking about the metadata, and I think when we get into that, that'll also show you some of the ways in which we're trying to categorize and make searchable and make transparent some of these aspects um, and that that'll kind of make clear that this multimodal aspect is also there um, listening and visualizing uh, the second level that we have is lessons so these are open educational lessons um, often around an open text but not exclusively and that was something else we heard coming up in the discussions um, is that some people want to work with what we might call a closed text so um, a poem for example that's been authored or a particular text that shows up in your textbook that where the lesson doesn't quite work for what you want to do and you want to create a new lesson around that same text. So these would be open lessons that other people can use, other people can perhaps modify, other people can share with attribution again that we'll come back to. Um, but they are often but not necessarily around an open text, if that makes sense. Then the third level, and this goes back a little bit to the textbook concept, although it's not necessarily a textbook, is what we're calling collections. And what we wanted to start to do is identify for people and identify among ourselves um, sets of texts that either work particularly well as a unit, as a module, perhaps as an entire course, um, or sets of texts that work particularly well with commonly used textbooks. Um, because I know, especially for some of the so-called more commonly taught languages. Um, there are textbooks that many institutions use. So what are some of the collections of texts that might work with that textbook? So this will be the space in which we'll be identifying these groupings, various kinds of groupings of lessons and of texts that a person might want to work with. Um, and the idea is to kind of create that as a professional development exercise as well, so that part of the, part of the editorial function of the site is not just having a dumping ground where we put maybe really excellent lessons, um, but they're not articulated. Um, but rather to have that flexibility where you can use them as one-off lessons, but you can also start to identify, well, what would it look if I threaded these together in some kind of way as part of a curriculum? And then the fourth, which is a little bit different, the fourth kind of materials that we want to share um, are what we're calling case studies. And so these will be small, um, almost kind of action research, informal, fairly informal, but action research narratives or descriptions or small studies of people who are working with texts and lessons and collections from the site. And so that's something we hope to build, um, hopefully with many of you and also ourselves, um, into our own teaching so that people can have that um, professional development element of what does it actually look like to work with these materials and they can get fleshed out a little bit in the practice um, in addition to having those those different discrete items there. So I want to make a comment about the yeah. case studies. So I was saying at the beginning that what we hope to do around this website is create a community of practice. So the whole notion of a community of practice is based on informal learning where people develop an identity based on a set of practices and the group teaches each other then how to do whatever it is they do. And the original research, and the original kind of concept of uh, community of practice uh, started in the early 90s with some anthropologists who were studying Alcoholics Anonymous, among other groups. Because Alcoholics Anonymous, they teach you how to maintain sobriety. There are practices. So um, there are all kinds of informal learning groups, including how to then construct pedagogical materials. And the case studies then can be a description of, for example, where I found my text, which is a very important, where do you look for things? Uh, how did I manipulate it? What was the reception of my, um, my user-generated materials in classroom? So these kinds of case studies, I think, are a crucial point in telling other people how to do this. It could be case studies of how people adapt or transform existing lessons. Um, because one of the things that I think is really important is that taking into consideration all these contexts, you might find a lesson that uh, you're really intrigued by. But for example, it was developed for a second year collegiate course and you teach in a high school. And you think to yourself, this is exciting, but I'd have to modify it. And one of the things that you might want to then add is another version of that lesson, because these are open resources, but also maybe a case study about this is why I modified this existing lesson, and these are the reasons, this is the logic for that. And in that sense, that narrative also becomes an element of professional development as you help other people to think themselves into not just what's there, but what can I do with these things. Make sure you tell us, if, you're, if you try to tackle a lesson, what worked, but what didn't work. 